Welcome to lecture two of Philosophy of Science for Psychologists. This lecture is about René Descartes and the British empiricists Locke, Berkeley and Hume. In lecture one, we have looked at skepticism. Skeptics say we don't know anything. It's impossible to acquire knowledge. Uh, the problem is the justification. If you say that knowledge is a justified and true belief, then of course we do have beliefs. They might even be true, but we can't explain how we know that they are true. That's the problem. So skeptics say knowledge is impossible, and then rationalists and empiricists argue against the skeptic, but they also disagree. So a rationalist will say the source of knowledge is our ratio, the proper use of our reason, and an empiricist will say, no, if you want to know what the world is like, how the world is like, what the facts are, then you have to use your senses, then you get all kinds of experiences, and that's the source of knowledge. And we have seen that Socrates is the ancient Greek skeptic, Plato is clearly the um, rationalist in that time, he's an extreme rationalist, you might say, because Rationalists have this associated claim that there is innate knowledge and Plato argues that all our knowledge, all our real proper knowledge actually is innate. The empiricist that's usually discussed when we are discussing epistemology with respect to ancient Greece is Aristotle, um, even though he uses observation as his main method of gaining knowledge about the world and looks to be an empiricist, we also saw that he had a rationalist element in his epistemology. So he uses this intuitive induction and that's basically not what a proper empiricist uh, is allowed to use uh, as a justification for knowledge, for their true beliefs. Today we we'll start by looking at the philosophy of Francis Bacon, who broke with Aristotle. He argues that we should have a new method, a new method compared to the old method of Aristotle that was still being used in medieval times. He was not the only one, but he wrote things down, so he had a lot of influence on that, and it made possible to think about knowledge for yourself again. You don't refer only to the Bible or only to Aristotle. You can only you, you can also think for yourself. So Bacon did not break with the Bible, right? So he said this coupling of Aristotle and the Bible was incorrect. The Bible is right, Aristotle was wrong, and now you can attack Aristotle again because there is no immediate link with the Bible anymore. So he did not uh, attack Christianity. He, he was a devout Christian. Uh, the same goes for René Descartes. He was a Catholic, uh, but he also totally disagreed with Aristotle. We'll see that uh, in section two. So what happens, of course, is that when you start thinking about, your, uh, about knowledge again, then again, this debate between rationalist and empiricist surfaces. And of course, combined, they argue against the skeptic. We'll see that as well. So uh, after we discuss uh, René Descartes, we'll also take a look at the British empiricists, Locke, Berkeley and Hume. And then, of course, we'll take a look at uh, whether uh, this all makes sense that uh, it is uh, the, the project is successful uh, of the rationalist of the empiricist to show that a skeptic is wrong. So are they successful in showing that the skeptic is wrong? We'll see that at the end of this lecture and we'll end of course with a preview and a test question. We start today's lecture with the introduction of the ideas of Francis Bacon. He was important because he was the one that argued that we should no longer listen to Aristotle. 
In our previous lecture, we saw that Aristotle wanted to have knowledge about nature, about natural ways. That means that if you, according to Aristotle, that means that if you manipulate the world, the natural world, you do not learn anything about the nature of things, but you learn something about the manipulation of things, and that's not what you was interested in. You, you were interested in. So, in the end, this boiled down to a ban on uh, experiments. And of course, from our contemporary view, our contemporary perspective, that's really strange because now we know that experiments provide provide us with a lot of information, a lot of knowledge about the world, including the natural world. One of the philosophers arguing that we should do, we should be allowed to do experiments was Francis Bacon. So he questioned Aristotle, and to be sure, he did not question the Bible. We'll see that clearly in a moment. So we should use experiments in our new method. Bacon basically described this new method. Others, of course, were already doing it as well. So there was this new scientific method, we should say that it was the start of contemporary science, in which we should, for instance, he said, in this new method, we should abandon our epistemic prejudices. I'll look at that in a moment. We'll need to use the empirical method, and we need to use induction. And as you recall, Aristotle also used induction. So what's the problem here? What's the new thing here with respect to induction? Aristotle also argued if you see a lot of chairs, then you in use induction to come to this concept of uh, a chair, this universal concept, this general concept of a chair. The same goes where you see all kinds of human beings. Some die and then you use induction to infer that all human beings are mortal. What's the problem with that? If Bacon says, well, we need to use a new method, and this new method includes induction. Hmm. Okay, well, let's take a look at it. Let's start with uh, human beings, researchers. If you want to gain knowledge, then you have to abandon your epistemic prejudices. Bacon calls the epistemic prejudices also false conceptions. They are biases, we would say in our contemporary terminology. So he's talking about biases with respect to knowledge. He's not about, he's not talking about prejudices uh, that uh, are sexual or uh, racist uh, prejudices. So he's talking about what we now would call biases and he says, be aware of the biases. He calls them also idols. Be aware of the idols we have because they stand in the way of acquiring knowledge. You might think you have acquired knowledge, but there are all kinds of biases that if you don't know about them, if you don't know that you yourself have all these biases, all these idols, all these false conceptions, then you might un end up with, well, what Plato calls dogs are mere belief, mere opinion, and not knowledge. So we should be aware of our biases, our idols. And he says, well, I see several categories of idols. Idols of the tribe, idols of the cave, of the marketplace, and of the theater. And those are all different categories of idols different categories of biases. He, he didn't word, use the word bias, of course, he, he, but uh, he used uh, prejudices or uh, idols or idola in, uh, uh, in Latin. So let's take a look at them and then see that even though there was no psychology, there was no science that uh, had the name psychology uh, back then, he basically says there is a role for psychologists in epistemology, if you want to acquire knowledge, you should take into account how the human mind works. 
when we acquire knowledge. And what the mistakes might be in acquiring knowledge. This will, will become uh, a huge issue in this course. But let's now for a moment take a look at these four different categories of idols that Bacon distinguishes and give some examples, explain what they are and give some examples. First, there are the idols of the tribe, the idola tribus. And those are the biases we have because we're human beings. In tribe, you might you might think, well, it's it's a part of humanity, it's a subgroup of humanity, it's your tribe. No, it's the tribe of humans. So those are mistakes every human being makes. Those are biases we all have. Compared to a visual illusion for every human being that, well, of course, you have to have eyes and, and a brain and stuff like that. So we're talking about uh, the normal human being. Uh, so if you have a visual illusion, you might learn that it's a visual, visual illusion. So you see a, a picture, static picture, static picture, but you have the experience that it's moving. But you pretty soon find out that it's a static picture, it's not a movie. But still, if you look at it, you still have this experience of movement. So it's really difficult to get rid of uh, our idols. And a visual illusion is very, a very simple one. And it could be that, well, just look at that and keep, keep focusing on that. And then you'll see it's not moving. And then look at that and look at that and look at that. And you'll see nothing is moving. And then you know, ah, it's an illusion that the picture is moving. So Bacon says, one interesting thing is seeing order and regularity where there is none. So you could, of course, see order and regular, regularity where there is. My guess is that Aristotle was right. All human beings are mortal. You have seen 10 human beings, they were all mortal. And then you infer, you use induction and say, well, that is a regularity I have discovered in the world. All human beings are mortal, not just those 10. But you might do the same with all swans are white. I've seen 10 swans, they were white. And then you conclude all swans are white. Well, are you sure about that? That's, of course, the induction problem. You are not. You can't be sure unless you have seen all the individuals of a set. If you have seen all the swans, well, that is impossible. You will not be able to see all the swans that will be born after you died. You've died. So that will be impossible. So we have to infer to regularities and you might infer that there is a regularity where there actually is none. Now, um, he also points at what we these days uh, call, uh, what these days we call confirmation bias. So <laughs> he described basically what had, uh, that, that existed, that we have uh, the inclination, the um, the disposition to accept confirming evidence and disregard uh, falsifying evidence, evidence that uh, disconfirms what we believe. Uh, also, and that's, that's of course uh, quite close to a visual illusion. We see the sun go down, but of course the sun doesn't go down, it's the earth spinning around its axis, uh, resulting in the illusion that the sun goes down but it's the earth turning. Uh, and it gives another example. And well, uh, it is an example that goes for, that it's, it's about the type of reasoning, not about the specific type of reasoning, because that would be, this specific example would be about uh, the next uh, idol. But he says there are sailors that trust in the power of prayer. Why? Well, they were in a storm at sea, they prayed to God, please save us, and now they are in, a, uh, in an inn in the harbour, and they tell people, see, God saved us, prayer works. Well, they disregard those sailors at sea in a storm that prayed to God, and that drowned because their ship uh, uh, went down in the storm. So this type of reasoning is something we all do. 
you see that something works and you disregard the evidence that shows that it doesn't always work. Okay, so that's the idol of the tribe. Then we have the idols of the cave and then we look at subsets. Then we look at groups of people where, we, where the group is smaller than uh, all of humanity. So it, it is about the epistemic prejudices we have because we belong to a particular cultural group, a subculture, you could say, or a subgroup. So there are people that say, well, in the past, everything was better. Make America great again. In the past, everything was better. It's a lot of crap now. Well, now it is, but uh, let's make America great again. So, okay, so apparently there's nothing good. It all had to change. Everything Obama did was wrong. Okay, so if you like that, Bacon says you have, uh, uh, you've fallen prey to an idol of the cave, uh, extreme conservatism. Uh, on the opposite, uh, saying that everything that is new is good. We see it in education. You get money if you have uh, an innovative idea in education. Well, I can make a lot of innovations in education, but it would not be an improvement. And maybe, maybe teaching with an old-fashioned piece of chalk on a blackboard might work better than doing all things online. But if you accept that, if you have the idea that everything that's new is better than what we had, then you also fall prey to the idols of the game. Then you belong to the subgroup that says, well, everything that's new is better. And of course, that is a subgroup because there are also these extreme conservatists. Uh, so, Bacon says, well, just look at the world and see what's good, keep path, and what's bad, and improve that. So, it's not all good or all bad. Both should be avoided, according to Bacon. And if you know that, so that's the idea, of course, he writes this down, because if you know what your biases are, what your idols are, what your epistemic prejudices are, then you can take them into account. Another example, uh, an older example, uh, but it is uh, interesting, I think. This is about 20 years ago, not that long ago. So 20 years ago, you could ask students the question, how many of you do you think, I mean, if you, you the group students, do you think have a mobile phone? My guess that these days, it's close to 100%. So this survey would make little sense. In 2000, not everybody did have a mobile phone. It was about 50%. And then what you see that happened was that those students that already had a mobile phone thought that the group of students that had a mobile phone was larger than it actually was. And the group that didn't have a mobile phone <laughs> also thought that the, per the, the group that did not have a mobile phone was larger than it actually was. It was uh, smaller. So they said uh, the group without a mobile phone thinks that 40% does have a mobile phone and that's bigger. And so the group that doesn't have a mobile phone is smaller. So you do think that others are like you. And that makes if you belong to a certain group then you take those properties of that group and you think that everybody has those properties okay now bacon also uh, distinguishes the idols of the marketplace the idola fori idola fori and these are the prejudices we have because we can talk about something, because we have words, and words refer to something. So the, the word cup or coffee, cup of coffee, refers to a thing like this. And uh, do cups of coffee exist? Yes, they do. So, and on the market, 
you have people selling stuff. So there's someone selling bananas and he shouts, bananas, bananas, bananas. And then you think, okay, this guy has bananas. Let's, I want some bananas. Let's go there and buy some. So the word bananas refers to this type of fruit. It exists. But what about people shouting witches? And you say, well, if you use the word witch in the common way, they just say, well, that's someone who uh, is able to put a spell on you and can fly on a broomstick through the, through the air and can change into a cat or something like that. Then witches don't exist, but we do have this word witch. So this is a word that doesn't refer to anything real. But since we do have the word, people are inclined to think that it refers because usually words refer. <clears throat> and that's the idol of the marketplace. So which is one? Uh, elan vital, a life-giving principle. You, these days, if you look at a biology book, they don't open they don't open with the sentence, uh, all living things have an élan vital in them. No, because now we know that élan vital doesn't refer to anything that's real. But it was a time we did think that. Uh, the element of fire or coincidence or luck. If you win the lottery, you have a lot of luck. Okay, what well, can I get that? Is it, can, can it give me one liter of luck or something like that? What, what is that? Now, it's just an event that's extremely unlikely, and if it happens, then we call that lucky. But there is no such thing as luck that you can have. I had luck, and you had bad luck. I don't want bad luck here. It's my bad luck here for you. Bacon says, these words seem to refer to something, and we talk about that. We say, well, you were really lucky. You had a lot of luck. No, I didn't. The word doesn't refer to anything real. So you might, if you think about gaining knowledge, about acquiring knowledge, you might sometimes think that something exists while there isn't. You might do research into witches. People have done that, but witches don't exist. And then you, it's dangerous, right? Because if you think they're witches, then you're going to accuse people of being witches and then you might even kill them in a very horrible way. And then your idol of the marketplace really has severe consequences, or at least the not recognizing that you have the idol of the marketplace. So Bacon was onto something. Biases are really important to uh, recognize. Right. Uh, the last bias idol he distinguishes the last category of epistemic prejudices is, is the idols of the theater and this is quite interesting because bacon says well the idols of the theater basically is you imagine a theater and there is someone an authority is telling you the way the world is it's like a lecturer but he's thinking about well ancient philosophical schools. He's basically thinking about his teachers that say Aristotle was right in everything. And we have the idol of thinking, of believing someone who is regarded as an authority. And that is of course a problem because some people are real authorities and some aren't. And the interesting thing here is that Bacon, who wants to say, well, Aristotle, yeah, he was smart and he had a lot of things maybe correct, but you can't just say that everything he said was correct. He had a lot of strange things in his theory, uh, in his philosophy, he had a, a lot of uh, clear falsehoods in his theory. So we should reject that he was an authority on everything. But, as I said at the beginning of this lecture, Bacon rejected Aristotle, but not the Bible. And the interesting thing is that you could, of course, also argue that what's in the Bible, is, and, you, and when you believe what's in the Bible, 
as a historical document, and Bacon seemed to have done that, seems to have done that. He seems to say, well, read the Bible, and then you'll see that there was paradise on earth, there was Eden. And then, well, Adam and Eve did all kinds of things wrong, and then they uh, got sent out of paradise. But in paradise, there was no sickness, there were no people that were ill. Everything was good. If you see that as a historical document, then you fall prey to the idol of the theatre. Then you think, oh, this is an authority on, well, the creation of Earth and the creation of man, and or how man came into being, um, how human beings came into being. So, if you think that, then you fall prey to the idol of the theatre. The interesting thing further is that uh, Bacon wanted to use experiments to find out more about the world. He wanted to get rid of our idols, and he failed a little bit himself. Why? Well, because he wanted to return to paradise. That is, he wanted knowledge to enable humanity to create a world again that is a paradise where there is no sickness, where nobody is ill. So you can imagine that a lot of scientists, thinkers, philosophers were thinking about how to improve everyday life, how to get rid of sickness. Because a lot of people died, of course, back then from, well, uh, things we don't die of uh, anymore. All kinds of viruses, uh, and they used uh, bloodletting, uh, so they got rid of some blood uh, when you had a fever or something like that. And uh, then, of course, you got, uh, <laughs> in most cases, uh, your illness got worse. So people died from uh, all kinds of uh, illnesses. As they still do, but uh, back then, uh, much more. So he wanted knowledge to have power. So this slogan, knowledge is power, we often associate that with having knowledge is having political power. But Bacon, who introduced this, who, who came up with his meme, we would say, this slogan, he said knowledge is the power to change the world back to its original state, this original state of paradise, and then people have better lives. So basically, he also did what we at this university want to do. We want to understand society, want to understand the world, to advance it, to make it a better world. And that's what many scientists, many researchers, of course, did. And still do. You want to have knowledge because you want to improve the world. You make the, you want to make the world a little bit better. As a psychologist, you probably also want to do that. You want to do experiments. You want to do research, and then you want to gain knowledge about the world in order to make the world a little bit better. But these days we have a big problem. We have for instance, in psychology, but also in other fields of, in other disciplines of science, a reproduction crisis. So what happens is you have to be original. Because if you want your paper, your article to be published, you don't publish something that's already known. So you want to have a hypothesis that is original, but you also want to have confirmation for your hypothesis. Because if you say, this is my hypothesis, and it's rejected, the, the evidence shows that it's false, then a journal might say, well, that's not very interesting. So you came up with a, with a hypothesis and it turned out to be false. Well, I'll go back home, uh, go back to the university and come up with a hypothesis that you have find positive evidence for. And then we might think about publishing it if it's original. So don't take a hypothesis that's also already been uh, shown that there is positive evidence for. So. That's a, a bad system because it uses the bias we have. It uses our confirmation bias we have. 
we, we, we're coming up with hypotheses, and what do you do? You stimulate scientists in finding confirmation for their hypothesis, and they already have a confirmation bias because they're a human being, and all human beings have confirmation bias. So that means that nobody is going to do, and you have to be original, so this combination means that nobody, or un, until recently, nobody was doing uh, uh, replication uh, research. So you want to reproduce, replicate the same um, results in order to be more sure of your conclusions because you will also you will always use induction so you have a subset you, you have a hypothesis and you do research on a subset of uh, the individuals of uh, the entire group in, in psychology usually humans so you, you do your research you, well, you just have uh, a small number of usually also psychology students you do your research with uh, your research on and uh, then you say, well, this goes for every human being. <clears throat> and then you go on to the next hypothesis, which you hope to confirm, because then you get published. So there is this crisis in the reproduction, so in the re replication of uh, experiments that have been done by other researchers. And now they have done some, they've tried to replicate some experiments, and then it shows that many of the results could not be reproduced. Okay, then you have a problem. It seems that we have fallen prey to our epistemic prejudices, to our idols, as Bacon would say. Um, in psychology and also in other sciences, but uh, it's very clear at this moment in psychology. So that's an important example that shows that these idols are still relevant, still relevant to scientists. And of course, it's also relevant to psychology because psychology is the science that discovers these biases at least part of psychology is uh, doing re research into that domain of our biases that means that psychology is actually really important for epistemology philosophy of science and all the sciences we'll return to that in more detail in lecture eight then we'll discuss naturalized epistemology which basically is um, a detailed version of what Bacon is saying here with the explicit reference to psychology and that then shows that we have to look at the relevance for of psychology to knowledge acquisition in our contemporary times and that's what we will do in lecture 9 through 15. Okay so let's return to Bacon and his view on experiments. We saw in Aristotle that Aristotle didn't say you shouldn't do experiments, but his idea was if you want to gain knowledge about the world, you want to have knowledge about the natural world, so you shouldn't manipulate the world, because then you don't learn anything about the natural world. It's unnatural to throw a rock up in the air. If you do that and you want to learn something about that movement, then you learn something about an unnatural movement and not about the natural movement of a rock that gets that gets uh, loose from uh, a cliff, for instance, and then makes it uh, move, moves it in, it in its natural way. So you can have you can't have experiments in Aristotle, and one of the big things that Bacon defended in his new method was that you should do or at least be allowed to do experiments because experiments do provide you with knowledge about nature about the world and if you don't do these experiments because of some aristotelian prejudice <laughs> because of 
the idol of the theater that Aristotle was right in everything, well, then you miss out on a lot of information about the world. So, and he did experiments himself. So he did an experiment. Uh, he, he, he had the hypothesis that if you freeze meat, then uh, it doesn't go bad uh, that quickly. So, and then uh, the um, story goes that he died doing this experiment. He had some uh, chicken meat and he put it in the snow and then he got pneumonia. And of course you can't get that um, from just being in the cold. You can't get coronavirus from just being in the cold or something like that. So it doesn't work like that. So that story is probably incorrect. It's probably the result of another experiment he did. Uh, he used massive quantities of opium once a year because he thought that would prolong his life. So he was not an addict in the sense that he used opium every day or every week or whatever. No, there was a specific time of year and then he says, well, I'm going to use a lot of opium, opium for a couple of days and that will prolong my life. Well, probably he took an overdose or had uh, all kinds of chemicals in his opium that killed him. Uh, so, um, well, we know that using too much opium will not prolong your life. But you are allowed to do experiments, and these days that's part and parcel of the scientific method. And we owe that, amongst others, to Bacon. Of course, other scientists were already doing experiments as well. So he wrote things down that people that were that were breaking with Aristotle were already doing, right? So it's not all uh, credits only to Francis Bacon, but he wrote it all down and he added the idols. So it's really an important philosopher slash scientist. Now, one thing that we should discuss is that Bacon says we should use induction in science because, well, you can only gather data about specific individuals. You can only see that these human beings are mortal. Not that every human being is mortal, but you do want these general claims to make predictions about the next human being, about the next swan. You see 10 swans that are white, you induce, you infer using induction that all swans are white, and then you can predict that the next one will be white as well. So Bacon sometimes is classified, classified as an empiricist, but, uh, but he has also some uh, rationalist elements in his, um, in his epistemology. So um, not, let's not go there. Uh, he uses uh, both um, perception and understanding. And uh, good science uses observation and rational in inference. So you need to use induction. And we'll take a look at what the problem is, uh, the, the differences with uh, respect to Aristotle, because Aristotle also says we should use induction. So Bacon, again, did some own uh, research, some own uh, analysis, and he says, well, I want to know uh, things about heat, what's that, uh, where does it come from, what, what causes it, and then he looked at different, and that's important, he looked at different things where he says, well, they produce, they all produce heat, friction, uh, light, for instance, uh, fermentation processes uh, also produce heat, and then he says, well, I think heat can be explained from the movement of, well, I can't see them, but tiny particles, and they move and they produce Heat in all these cases, and that it maybe then is what heat is. So, and that's very close to how we think about it these days. So you use induction when you look at, well, individual cases. You can only observe individual cases. You cannot observe all human beings. So that was, of course, why Aristotle says, well, I have seen 10 human beings. Those human beings were mortal, and now I use intuitive induction to see with my news, with my ratio, with my mind, that it has to be true always. It's a 
regularity. It's a necessary truth. And then you say, well, how can you see that that's necessarily true? What's the reason? Yeah, well, it's my intuition. Well, and Bacon says, hmm, that is a problem. So you want to gain knowledge about the world. You should not have your idols lead your quest for knowledge. And the problem is, you see a regularity where there might not be regularity. So you could say, well, Aristotle probably is right. I have the intuition as well, but it's just an intuition that all human beings are mortal. But is he also right that all swans are white? So we have this kind of psychology that makes it hard to let go of our ways of reasoning, of our biases, we should say, we would say. And later we'll take a look at how, how um, what explains that. Because biases, of course, also work up to a certain extent. Because probably it's true that all human beings are mortal. And then using that rule, all human beings are mortal, I am mortal, that would prevent you from doing stupid things that would kill you. So biases do work, but they don't always work. And that's what Bacon notices. And basically using induction is seeing regularity where there might not be regularity, but there might not be regularity. There could be the regularity you infer, but you don't know. And that is the difference between Aristotle and Bacon. Aristotle was wrong according to Bacon. Why? Well, he didn't take the problem of induction seriously enough. So you should always if you have found a regular a regularity, a law based on some uh, individuals, 10 human beings that were mortal, 10 swans that were white, you should always look for, well, the refutation of your general claim, the rejection, the falsification. So you should always look for the black swan you should always go to another country and see whether all human beings are mortal there or well whether humans die from the same causes there or die in the same circumstances as they do here and you should look uh, whether uh, there are black swans in other countries for instance or other areas so bacon looks for possible refutations of the general claim you get by using induction based on a subset of the individuals. Okay, so that's what Bacon basically said about Aristotle and induction. Aristotle wasn't critical enough. He should have think, thought about induction more critically. So, Bacon broke with Aristotle. That's very clear, and he warned us for our idols. Bacon basically paved the way for others to also think for themselves to reject Aristotle. And then of course you'll see that there is again the debate between the skeptic, the rationalist and the empiricist. And we start with looking at the rationalist René Descartes. Descartes lived in the times that Galileo was condemned by the church, Descartes himself got also into trouble with both the Catholic and the Protestant church uh, because he allegedly was an atheist and, uh, well, he wasn't. Uh, he was uh, uh, honestly uh, a Catholic and I think he really believed in God. Uh, that also follows if you if you look at the letters uh, he wrote to elizabeth uh, the princess of bohemia for instance uh, it's clear that he was a, a true catholic um, but uh, he got into trouble with uh, the catholic church and the protestant church for being an atheist effort attacking aristotle he, he, he totally disagreed with aristotle so um in the end uh well quite quite early he already uh went to the netherlands and he lived most of his adult life here and he 
also wrote most of his books thus uh, in the Netherlands. So he was a rationalist. But, as I said earlier, rationalism is not identical to the view of Plato. Plato is one form of rationalism, and Descartes' epistemology is also a form of rationalism. He does believe that knowledge stems from the ratio, from the proper use of, of your reason, and he also does believe in the associated uh, claim of nativism, that is, that there is innate, inborn knowledge. Now, Descartes also was concerned with this idea of certain knowledge. He does have all kinds of beliefs. So he goes back in his life, he has all kinds of beliefs, that means he has mental states which he thinks represent the world the way the world is. But is that knowledge? In other words, are his beliefs true beliefs and can he give a justification for his beliefs? And what he does is he gives a rationalist justification of his beliefs. So he was looking for certain knowledge and, well, I think he believed he succeeded in finding a justification for his true beliefs. So what are you absolutely sure of? Well, prior to having a justification, you should say, well, anything I can doubt, I'm not sure of. And Descartes accepts that at first. So he responds to the skeptics, the skeptics that can doubt everything. And in this case, the skeptic is Michel de Montaigne. And he didn't even claim, I know nothing. Because if you claim not to know anything, then you're making a knowledge claim. It seems that that's true and that you know that that's true. So you say, I can doubt everything and therefore I'm justified in believing that I do not know anything, I know nothing. And that means that you do know something. So he goes a step further and he doesn't make a claim. He doesn't even make the claim, I know nothing. He says, que sais je? What do I know? So he asks a question. And in his question is, well, his entire skepticism. Uh, it, it contains his entire skepticism, even up to the point that he doesn't want to make this one claim that he doesn't know anything. So. And a, a question, of course, is not true or false. It's just a question. So he doesn't make a knowledge claim at all. Now, he had this idea of having a belief and that you can give arguments in favor of that belief. And you put that, as it were, on a scale, on a balance. And then you have arguments against that belief. And you put them also on the balance. And he says, on the, on the scale, and he says this scale is always in balance. Because you can always find a new argument in favor or against uh, some belief. And you're trying to use these arguments to justify your belief. But you, it's just as easy to justify the belief to the contrary. So what do I, what, what do I know? <laughs> I have arguments in favor and against any belief. And he doesn't want to say, I know nothing, because then he makes a knowledge claim. So he says, the scale is always in balance, and that results in me asking myself the question, what do I know? Which beliefs do I know they are true? Do I have a justification for that they are true? Well, basically none. So doubting everything, doubting every belief, is the method of the skeptic. I can doubt whether there is, a, I can doubt there is a physical world. Okay, I can do that. Uh, but that, of course, amounts to saying, well, if I can doubt that a physical world exists, then I can doubt that my claim that a physical world exists is true. So I do not know that a physical world exists. Okay, that's skepticism. Descartes, like all rationalists, like all empiricists, 
tries to refute the skeptic. He tries to come up with an epistemology that shows the skeptic wrong, that shows that there is knowledge possible. And we have seen we have different ways of trying to do that. We have the empiricist way. We saw that in the previous lecture. And we have the rationalist way. We also saw that in the previous lecture. That was the way that Plato took. And it's also the route that Descartes, Descartes takes. But he does it in a different way. He's not as radical as Plato was. But he argues against skepticism. And he does that by using the method of the skeptic. That is interesting, I think. So Descartes says, I have all these beliefs of which I, let's say, hope that they are true, which I hope that is knowledge, but if I can doubt anything, then I can't say it's knowledge. So let's, let me use this method of my opponent, the skeptic, and try to see whether there is something I cannot doubt, and then see why that's the case, if that's the case. So he says, okay, let, let's do this. Let's do this experiment of a radical doubt, use that method, the method of, the, of my opponent. And in that way, I think it's interesting because he makes his opponent as strong as possible. Like he says, okay, I'll accept your method. If you can doubt something, I can't claim it's true. And therefore it's not knowledge. So I, everything, every belief I think is true, but which I can doubt, like there is a physical world, Descartes believes that there is a physical world, he thinks that the statement is belief there is a physical world is true. But, okay, he says, if I can doubt that there is a physical world, then I no longer regard the claim the physical world uh, exists as true. Now, Descartes went to school at La Fleche, and there he got a proper education, but it was an Aristotelian focused education. And Descartes already saw that Aristotle was not right in everything. His teachers probably thought Aristotle was right. They were French Jesuits and they basically taught Aristotle's uh, physics and logic and uh, well, anything of his philosophy. So Descartes says, can I regard my teachers as a proper source of knowledge? Well, no, they might have believed that what they said was true, that what Aristotle said was true, but they were wrong in several cases, and how can I know that they weren't wrong in other cases? So your teachers might try to convince you of the truth of some theory or a statement, but they might be wrong. So if something or someone has been wrong in a previous case, how do I know that this person or this method is right in this case? So if my teacher only made just one error, how do I know that this teacher doesn't make errors all the time? I don't know. So that means that you cannot trust your teachers. They might be truthful, they might think they're telling the truth, but you don't know. So that means you can't say, how do I know this? By answering, my teachers told me so, because your teachers might be wrong. So anything your teachers told you might be wrong. And he says, well, then I, I might in some cases even believe that they were right, but it's just, I believe it's not knowledge. Okay, so you can't trust teachers. You can also not trust your own senses, because if your senses have deceived you once, if you thought you saw something and you actually didn't, then how do I know that my senses do not deceive me right now? So he gives the example, I'm at a path in a forest and the path is three meters wide. And in the end, I see, I look at the end of the path and the path is just three centimeters wide, if I have to estimate it. And then I go there and I see that the path is three meters wide and I turn around and see that the path, the beginning where it just was when it was three meters wide now is two, uh, sorry, three centimeters wide. He says, well, at least in one case, my senses have 
not informed me properly about the world. So how can I trust my senses? So any belief that results from using your senses is a belief that, well, it might be true, but you don't know. You can't use your senses to justify your beliefs. So all those beliefs are just beliefs, are not knowledge. So here you see that he argues against empiricism. He is not an empiricist. He says, I, I don't use my senses as the source of knowledge. And he goes further and further. He says, well, do I know that there is a physical world then? My senses might deceive me, but maybe there indeed is a physical world. He says, well, I, I'm sitting here by the fire. He's writing things down in a, in, in a book and I, or on paper. And he's sitting near the fire and there's a table near him. And uh, he, says, he says, how do I know that there really is this physical world? Maybe I am uh, upstairs in my bedroom uh, in bed sleeping and dreaming. Maybe I'm dreaming them that I'm writing this book. Maybe you're dreaming you're watching this movie. And he says, okay, I don't know, but then there still would be a physical world if I'm upstairs in my bed, uh, sleeping and dreaming that, there, uh, that these events take place. But it might even be the case there is an evil demon that kind of, cre kind of has created a dream world in which I think there is a physical world, while there actually is no physical world at all. Not even one in which I am asleep. I might not have a body. I don't know, I can doubt I have a body. So basically, he says in, in, in uh, contemporary terms, there might be uh, an evil power, all powerful demon, that has such power that he has created a virtual reality in which I live, and I think that everything I perceive is real, but it isn't. And it goes even so far that he says, I do believe that two and two equals four. A mathematical truth of an easy problem. How much is two plus two? Well, it's four. And Descartes was a mathematician. He was a really good mathematician. And he says, I have tried to solve really, really difficult mathematical problems. And I thought I'd, I'd found the solution. But in fact, I didn't. But at the moment I, I came up with that solution, I thought it was a real solution, but it wasn't. Later, I found out that I was wrong. How do I know then that two and two equals four? Maybe I'm wrong there as well. So it really takes this method of radical doubt of the skeptic of his opponent really seriously. He says, I can even doubt that 2 and 2 equals 4. Maybe the evil demon has so much power that he makes me believe that 2 and 2 is 4, while it actually is 9 and 3 quarters. Whatever. You're like Neo in the Matrix, if you've seen the movie The Matrix. You are in a pod. Well, he is in, Neo is, of course, a physical body in a pod, but he gets out of the Matrix. Well, is he? Did he? That, of course, is a problem. You get out of the matrix, but maybe into a new matrix, a virtual reality. The matrix is a virtual reality, if you haven't seen it. So Descartes says, what do I know then? I can doubt anything. I can doubt what my teachers told me. I can doubt what my senses tell me. I can tell, doubt what my ratio tells me, that 2 and 2 equals 4. I can even doubt that. Maybe. There is no knowledge at all. And maybe I should say, well, and now I've, I've used the method of the skeptic. I come to the same conclusion. I know nothing. And then he says, no, 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 no. That's not my conclusion. He says, if there would be such a hypothetical evil demon, this evil demon could never make me believe that I do not exist. He could never doubt, make, make me doubt my own existence or the belief that I exist. Because if I doubt my existence, then I would think I do not exist. And then he says, well, in order to think I do not exist, in order to think you have to exist. And that's his first truth. The cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. I think I am has to be true each time he's thinking that. That's 
is first truth. So he says, I cannot doubt it. I cannot doubt my own existence. For if I doubt my own existence, I have to exist. Even if three is the case, even if there, if there is an evil demon, a malajini, that creates a virtual reality in which I believe I have a physical body, but I actually don't have a physical body. Even if there's no physical world, if that's true, if, it, if, the, if the claim there is no physical world is true, even if that's true, I don't think that's that true, but even if that's true, I cannot doubt my own existence. So Descartes asks his readers to perform these, this thought experiment of the radical doubt and this, this, this scenario with the evil demon. He invites the reader to perform this thought experiment uh, themselves. So he asks you, do this meditation, do this thinking about knowledge. Can you trust your teachers? Do, do you agree with me that you, you cannot trust your teachers when it comes to providing you with absolute certain knowledge? And if you say, well, yeah, yeah, I have had teachers that were wrong, well, then you basically have to agree. So if you're a skeptic and reading this, you have to agree that I cannot trust my teachers. Oh, yeah, but that's, I'm a skeptic. That's what I was saying all along. You can't trust your teachers. You can't trust, trust your own senses. You can't trust your ratio. You can't trust anything. There is no knowledge possible. And then Descartes says, but if you, the reader, if you doubt your own existence, then you have to exist. So the conclusion, cogito ergo sum, is a conclusion that each reader themselves should infer. It's not that Descartes says, I know I am René Descartes and I exist, and you now know that I exist as well. No, you know that you exist. So you cannot doubt it. You cannot doubt your own existence. And that's his first truth, absolute truth. That's his first piece of knowledge. And now you see that he has a model of science, of knowledge, that starts with a foundation. You have a foundation, and we'll see later that empiricists also have this same metaphor. You have a foundation, and on that foundation, on that foundation, you build your um, building of knowledge. And if your foundation is rotten, then it will collapse and your building will collapse. But now, Descartes is this foundation. It's, he says, I know for 100% sure, I am sure about it, I'm certain that I think I exist, has to be true every time I think this. And now we see that he changes from his first method, the method of radical doubt, which actually is the method of his opponent, the skeptic. He changes to the second method, the second method is a rationalist method. Then it's the method of the clear and distinct perception, the clear and distinct insight. Because he asks the question, how do I know with absolute certainty that I think I am has to be true each time I think this? And he sees, I see this clearly, it's not confused. And distinctly, it's separated from all other things. It's clearly and distinctly that I perceive this. There is no confusion. It's, it's a rational, rationalistic insight. So he says, I see this clearly and distinctly. And therefore, I know that I think that the sentence, the belief, I think therefore I am, has to be true each time I think this. And this second method of the clear and distinct insight, that helps him to get rid of the evil demon, of the malagini. Because the problem now is, he knows he exists, you know you exist, but there is, in this hypothetical scenario, there is this evil demon that makes you believe that 2 and 2 equals 4, while it actually is 9 and 3 quarters. The evil demon makes you believe that you have a physical body, but you don't, you only have a mind. He makes you believe that there is a physical world, but there is no physical world. So these are all false beliefs. In principle, possibly. So what Descartes needs to do 
if he wants to have more knowledge than just I think therefore I am, he has to get rid of the evil demon. And well, when I explain this to students, the evil demon, they all go along and nobody says, well, that's really stupid, the evil demon, and uh, why, and I don't believe this. Uh, sure, you see that it's a method. And now, of course, what he's going to do is something that usually is something students have a lot of criticism uh, about. So he's going to replace the evil demon with, well, you might have guessed, a good demon. One that doesn't deceive you in thinking that two and two equals four. One that doesn't deceive you uh, in, uh, when you think that there is a physical world because there actually is a physical world. And of course, that's God. And the Kurt says, I clearly and distinctly see that God has to exist and that he is good. So why does he say that he clearly and distinctly see that God is good and that God exists? Well, it says God has to exist because I find myself in myself this concept of God. And in this concept of God is the notion of absolute perfection. perfection. There is nothing more perfect than God. That's what the concept of God says. And then Descartes says, he gives several proofs for the existence of God, but this is one of them. He says, I myself am not perfect. So how can I have this notion of absolute perfectness being imperfect myself? Such a notion has to come from something that is as perfect as is entailed in a notion. And that means that there has to be something that is absolutely perfect, and of course, that is God. So God has to exist, otherwise I could not have this notion. I could not have this idea, this concept. And then he says, in deceiving, what the evil demon does, is imperfection. But there's no imperfection in God, so God will not be a deceiver. I see this clearly and distinctly. So now he sees clearly and distinctly that God has to exist and that God is good. God is also, just like the, the hypothetical evil demon, God is also all powerful. God could deceive me in thinking that two and two equals four. I could deceive me when I think that there is a physical world, but God will not do that. If you use your ratio properly, then you will know that two and two indeed equals four, and you'll also be able to solve complex mathematical problems if you use the ratio properly. If you don't, well, then you might end up accidentally with the correct answer, or you'll end up with the incorrect answer. But if you use the ratio properly, you will end up with the correct answer. You will end up with knowledge about the world, because there is no evil demon deceiving you. And the only thing that can happen is that you make mistakes and that's of course due to you and of course then we get into a theological debate about how God is all-powerful and all-knowing and created you and then you make mistakes did then God create you in such a way that you would make the mistakes already he knew that well let's not go there that's for Cartesian ethics and theology uh, the idea is that Descartes now says there is no evil demon there is God and God is good he will not deceive me so when I believe that there is a physical world, there actually is a physical world, and if I now do research about this physical world, if I use my reason properly, then I will find out the facts about the world. So then we have a rationalist method and a rationalist justification of our beliefs. There is a physical world, I have a physical body, there are other human beings, two and two equals four. Okay, and then you can go and develop more science. And Descartes was interested in how the blood uh, uh, was going through the body. Uh, he uh, so he, he did research into that. He was interested in uh, the question: Why are snowflakes uh, flat, and why do they have six corners? Um, so he tried to solve problems like that, for instance. Let me say a little bit about the innate ideas, the ideas are the, the, the theory of nativism, 
that's the associated theory, the associated claim of rationalism. All rationalists, in some sense, accept that nativism is true. We saw in Plato that he said all knowledge is actually innate because you remember the ideas. You have to remember the ideas and you already know uh, what the ideas are when you're born. You just have no access to them at that moment. Descartes is not that radical. He says there are some ideas that are innate. For instance, the idea of God we just talked about. So that is innate. That's not coming from something you have perceived. That is put into you by God, of course. The idea of a triangle, you can't observe a perfect triangle, a real triangle. The, 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 the idea of a triangle indeed is uh, an idea. So those are innate ideas. And then there are lots of ideas that are acquired using your senses, like the idea of the sun. The idea of the sun, how do you get it? Well, if you open your eyes and it's daytime and it's not clouded, then you will see the sun. But... If you only would only use your senses then, then you might think that the sun is like this big because you look at it and well, not, not straight into the sun, but it's, it's about this big. Or if you look at the moon, it's the same goes for the moon. If you look at the moon, the moon is like this big. Well, but if you, with your ratio, with your reason, understand that the moon and the sun are far away, then you know that they are much larger. So what you do is, if you have ideas that stem from observation you have acquired during your life then you have to use reason to check them whether they are correct and they say well of course the sun is not this big the sun is huge it has to be and then he says there are also invented ideas you have for instance the invented idea of the flying horse pegasus well you have seen horses you have seen doves you put the wings of the doves in your mind to a horse and you have the flying horse Pegasus and then you can have knowledge about that if you you can have knowledge about Greek mythology for instance so I hope that the difference with Plato is clear here not all ideas are innate according to Descartes Plato says all ideas are innate are inborn Descartes says just some of them are inborn and all the others we have to check with our reason, making Descartes still a rationalist. And of course, his method for the clear and distinct insight, that's clearly not uh, a theory about observation, but about using your ratio, your reason properly. So that's a big difference between Plato and Descartes. So if I ask on the exam a question about rationalism in general, please don't assume that either of them is rationalism either of those uh, epistemologies is rationalism in general in general it's just ratio is the reason uh, sorry ratio is the source uh, of uh, knowledge reason is the source of knowledge and the associated idea that knowledge at least some knowledge is inborn now as I just said, usually people have problems with Descartes' proof of the existence of God. If you do not see clearly and distinctly that God is, has to exist, and if you do not clearly and distinctly perceive that God also is good, then you'll end up with the hypothetical but possible situation that there is an evil demon fooling you in thinking that there's a physical world, fooling you in thinking that there, that you have a physical body, and fooling you even in that 2 and 2 equals 4. And then you land up with skepticism, because the only thing you then know is, I think, therefore I exist. What, do, what else do I know? Well, nothing. So, it's almost skepticism. And the skeptic is right, maybe the skeptic says, well, okay, sure, I agree. I have to exist but I don't see it that God exists and therefore the rest of my beliefs about the physical world cannot be classified as knowledge they're just beliefs as mere, mere, mere beliefs or doxa in terms of Plato and that means that Descartes might have been optimistic himself but his opponent and maybe also we now reading his 
uh, philosophy hundreds of years later, we might say, well, I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced that we can get any further than the cogito. The cogito is the name for the slogan cogito ergo sum. So he discovered the cogito. He tried to replace the method, the first method of radical doubt, the method of the skeptic, with the method of the rationalist, of Descartes himself. And if you don't buy that, and most people don't, then you'll end up with skepticism with respect to the physical world. You can't have knowledge about that. And Descartes, of course, himself was optimistic. But if we evaluate it, we have to say, we don't accept your argument for the existence of God, because you could easily say, well, it's, th this argument is based on the notion of perfection not coming from an imperfect being. Well, but you could also say, well, uh, I'm imperfect. Uh, I use the negation of imperfect. <laughs> which is not imperfect, which is perfect. Well, that might be a way of uh, getting to the concept of perfectness. And that does not imply then that there is something that is as perfect as you have postulated, if, if the co uh, that is, that is uh, uh, implied in the concept of perfectness. That's just one way of arguing and then Descartes of course could argue against that he did as a matter of fact and there are many many uh, ways of attacking uh, his different uh, proofs for the existence of God and even if you believe in God you probably will not buy his proof so then you'll end up with skepticism and then we should do something else if we want to refute the skeptic let me mention one more thing why people were quite optimistic about gaining knowledge, and that is the discoveries made by Newton. Descartes developed mathematics, ideas about the physical world. One of his ideas was that the physical world was a kind of a clock, it's a big mechanism, which you can then uh, make pr predictions about. Newton discovered all kinds of laws about this mechanistic universe, and that means that both Descartes and Newton had this idea of this mechanistic world, mechanistic universe, and Newton discovered these laws and they work very well. So he predicted all kinds of events in the world and the predictions came true, they were successful. So then you can say, well, maybe we don't have a justification for our beliefs, but we still think we have discovered true things about the world. We still think that it's knowledge. And that, of course, is what a belief is. You believe that it's true. So you can also say, in, in some practical sense, it looks like this, the skeptic has been defeated. You have, and, and you have, of course, if you do believe in God, you might say, well, maybe I don't buy Descartes proof for the existence of God, but clearly Descartes is right that there is no evil demon, but there is a good God, and therefore there is a physical world, and therefore we can get knowledge about it, and therefore if predictions are successful the way that the predictions of Newton were, that is knowledge. So we can understand that philosophers, scientists, were pretty optimistic about gaining knowledge about the world. It worked. The discoveries of Newton they worked in predicting the world. So it didn't, it, it might not have worked from our perspective. It did seem to work from the perspective of Descartes. Uh, but of course, not everybody agreed with Descartes. Also not back in those days. Descartes thus thought that he could actually acquire justified and true beliefs, knowledge, but if you reject his proof of the existence of God, then you land up with skepticism. The question is, of course, then whether the empiricist, the contemporary uh, empiricist of uh, Descartes, whether that they did it any 
better. The empiricists we will discuss are the British empiricists, John Locke, George Barclay, and David Hume. And we'll start with the first, also the historically first, of those three British empiricists, John Locke. John Locke rejects the, in, the idea of inborn ideas, so he rejects nativism, and that's an important argument, he gives an argument for that, and that's an important argument to reject rationalism. We have seen rationalists accept nativism, the idea that that at least some ideas are inborn, and then he formulates the empiricist principle. So where we saw in lecture one that Aristotle usually is presented as an empiricist, but never actually said himself that he was, Locke clearly says, I am an empiricist. Then we can look at the ideas, knowledge, concepts. So Locke says, I'm an empiricist. Knowledge comes from the experience we have when we use our senses. That results in knowledge, that results in ideas about the world. Then he classifies those ideas. We'll take a look at that. And we have to look at the distinction he makes between ideas and qualities. We have to look at what qualities are. And that takes us to the next empiricist charge, partly because he differs with respect to the qualities uh, in his epistemology when we compare it to John Locke's epistemology. So let's start by John Locke's rejection of inborn ideas. If empiricism is true, there cannot be any inborn ideas. Because if there are innate, inborn ideas, if nativism is true, then there is knowledge that you did not acquire using your senses. And empiricists say all knowledge stems from our senses, the use of our senses. Now, how does John Locke refute the theory of innate ideas? <clears throat> well, he looks at uh, the ideas, the innate ideas of the Cartesians. So in England, where John Locke lived, Descartes was huge. He, he was really uh, famous. He already died, but uh, uh, Locke had read uh, Descartes. Uh, Descartes had a lot of fans. There were a lot of Cartesians in England, and they claimed that uh, besides the idea of God, uh, for instance, the ideas of that what is, is, it is impossible to be and not to be at the same time and all kinds of moral principles are inborn. Locke focuses on these and he says, well, uh, I'm going to show you that those are not inborn ideas. The idea, the argument, I should say, of the rationalist that these ideas are inborn is goes as follows. You'll find these ideas in every human being. So that's one, you'll find them in everyone. And two, there's only one explanation for why they are found in every human being, and that is they are inborn. You're born with this knowledge. That what is, is it's impossible to be and not to be at the same time, and all kinds of moral principles. And Locke basically attacks both, both uh, elements here. He says, firstly, Universal principles, that is, principles you find in all human beings. So let's suppose it's true that that what is, is, that it is a universal principle, you'll find it in everyone. It could also be explained in another way. It could be explained in a way that you say, well, if you ask uh, someone, do you agree that that what is, is, and this person says yes, then this person already possesses a language, right? How can you find out that someone believes that what is, is, without asking? And then it means, well, if you can ask, this person already has acquired language. What's not to say that this person also has acquired, and that we all do that, <laughs> if you acquire knowledge, if, if you acquire language, that you also acquire this universal principle or this principle that that what is, is. 
and then it would be something that you've learned that you not you were not born with so that's one way he says it's not the only explanation of universal in, uh, principles that they are inborn there is also a theory that says an explanation that says well if you have a principle that you find in every human being every human being has learned that and that would be in line with empiricism and the second argument he provides against the argument of the rationalists in favor of these inborn ideas is well <laughs> you're trying to explain something that does not need explanation because it doesn't exist they are not universal we do not find those principles in children and fools those one and two so that what is is and it's impossible to be and not to be at the same time you don't find them in children and fools so it's not universal and then you don't have to explain why they are universal just like you don't have to explain uh, how witches can fly on broomsticks well they can't there are no witches and no human being is capable of uh, flying on a broomstick so how can a broomstick fly well yeah you might try to find an explanation for that but well doesn't make any sense because broomsticks can't fly the same goes for the universal moral principles he says not everybody has the same moral principles clearly there are criminals and uh, they have different principles different moral principles they might not even have moral principles just to show you that you're not universal so Descartes was really famous in England had a lot of followers there were a lot of Cartesians they believed in these inborn these innate ideas they believed in this theory of nativism and Locke shows well those principles you say that you find in everyone you don't find them in everyone so your explanation uh, is uh, well not needed anymore uh, and it's clearly not true that these principles are inborn in every human being so that's pretty damaging to rationalism and Locke of course needed to do that so in his book he starts with doing this he starts by saying there are no innate ideas and here's my argument and then he, of course he can go on and defend empiricism so, and he actually is an empiricist he formulates the empiricist principle so if we don't if you're not rationalist what are we we are empiricists says Locke we should be empiricist how do we uh, acquire knowledge well Locke is clear he says it, to this I answer in one word from experience so if you use your senses you get all these inputs and then you have experiences and that is how we get knowledge whence has it all the materials of reason and knowledge where does knowledge come from from experience okay that's clear Locke is an empiricist are we right in classifying him in categorizing him as an empiricist yes he says so himself okay so if we now find something that's incoherent with empiricism we should say that's something wrong with your theory John Locke you're you're wrong here it doesn't work or something like that where when we said it about Aristotle we just say well Aquinas was wrong in classifying his an, as an empiricist that's different of course so it, when Aristotle has rationalist elements in his epistemology it shows that Aquinas was wrong in classifying his as an, him as an empiricist while if we discover rationalist elements in Locke's epistemology he is wrong in classifying his view as empiricist and he should do it he could do two things he could say well I have also rationalist elements or he should reject the uh, rationalist elements so we'll come to that later Locke is very clear he's an empiricist knowledge come from experience you gain by using your senses that is by using perception so your normal senses eyes ears touch and reflection so that's your inner sense that's the way you get knowledge about the mind 
So we, we would say introspection, and that is also, you could say, a sense according to him, uh, the empiricist John Locke. So we gain knowledge, we gain ideas about the world by using our senses and our inner sense, reflection. And now Locke classifies the different ideas. And he says there are simple ideas and complex ideas. And a simple idea is an idea you cannot divide into components anymore, while a complex idea consists of different components, of different simple ideas. So you have ideas of one sense, for instance. Color, the color yellow, is, well, it's a simple idea. So you can't split it. You can't say, well, the idea of yellow consists of the combination of the following five ideas or the following two ideas. I don't know which they would be. It's just yellow. It's just one thing. You can't divide it. Same with sweetness. Sweetness consists of, well, just sweetness. So it's a simple idea. And sweetness is an idea we have by using one sense, taste. Yellow is a, an idea of a color we have acquired by using just one sense, vision. OK, no problem there. If you're an empiricist, you can have knowledge about simple ideas of one sense. No problem. You can track back how you got the idea of yellow by using your senses. Okay, and that's what an empiricist says. How do I know about yellow? Because I used my eyes. And then I got this experience, and that resulted then in my concept, my notion, my ID was the word back then of yellow. You can have also simple ideas of two or more senses. Then you have a simple idea like movement, and that is something you can acquire by using, well, vision. You can see something move from A to B, but you can also feel it. If you, well, if you're talking to someone and you're leaning on your bike, if you're talking on the street and you're leaning on your bike and you're not looking at your bike, even you might even close your eyes, you can feel the movement when your bike slips away or something like that. So you can feel movement as well. You can get this idea, knowledge about movement by using your eyes, but also uh, by using uh, a touch. Okay, then we have ideas of reflection. So reflection is your inner sense. So if we accept that, then an empiricist can acquire knowledge about your subjective inner mental life. You can have the idea of thinking about, about something or thought. And that is a simple idea of reflection. You have seen your thoughts with your inner eye, you could say. No problem there if you accept reflection, and let's do so. Let's not make that a problem for empiricists. Because you could say, in some sense, I do experience that. So I don't think that there is really a problem there. And of course, you can then combine perception, so using your ordinary senses and reflection, just like you can have two or more senses. You can have touch and vision. And if you use either of them, you can acquire the idea of movement. And now you can have touch, vision, uh, taste, or something like that, and reflection to find out about a certain idea. In this case, uh, um, or one example that Locke gives is pain. Uh, you can use your uh, touch, of course. And with touch, you, you feel that there is uh, tissue damage or something like that, that you say, oh, that's pain, that's, that's over here, and it... Uh, uh, is uh, located on my, on my hand or something like that, you use your perception, but also reflection that you say, well, if I look with my inner eye to what I experience now, oh, I can see that is pain. Again, no problem here. So the simple ideas, the way Locke classifies them, are all ideas you indeed can get from experience. Okay, no problem. The problem resides with some of the Complex ideas are ideas 
that are combine uh, combinations of uh, uh, simple ideas. So ideas for, of mode, for instance, so they are about properties of something, like the beauty of a painting is, is the example that Locke gives. Then you say, well, you have to have shape and color and uh, all kinds of other ideas maybe, so you can uh, experience that as beautiful. So you have to combine that. So there you have complex ideas. Okay, so okay, I can look at a painting, I can uh, experience it as a beautiful painting, so no problem. The problem is with the idea of substance, so let's skip that for a moment. I first go to the, this is the order he discusses them in, uh, first go to the ideas of relation. Now, can you see, can you observe, can you use your perception or your reflection to see, to know that I am a brother of someone? No. So is that a problem then for an empiricist? No, because if you know what, a, what the word a brother, what the word brother means, then you say, well, born from the same woman, uh, and then you, uh, in principle, can observe that, could have observed that, and that is the notion of a brother can be traced back to things you can actually observe, even though it's an idea of relation, and you might not see the relation right now, you might not be able to observe that, it is something that in principle could be observed and you could therefore have knowledge about it. So you might say, well, initially it looked like a problem, but it actually isn't the idea of relation. The idea of substance though is a problem. So we saw in Descartes what a substance is when we discussed that also in the, um, uh, we discussed Descartes just now, but we also discussed them in the philosophy of mind course, of course. So. He says a substance is something that can exist on its own, but it is also classified, it's also uh, uh, defined as something that has all kinds of properties. So if, if you take a look at this cup, it is a physical thing, it's a physical substance and it has all kinds of properties. It has a shape, it has a height, it has a color. And now if, you, if I ask you, what do you observe? Then you observe all those properties. You observe the shape, the height, the color. You don't observe the substance. So how can you have knowledge of a substance as an empiricist? Descartes was a rationalist. He could say, well, I can infer that there has to be, if I, if I have all these properties here located there, then there has to be something that has these properties. And then you can use your reason, your ratio, to conclude, well, then there has to be something I do not observe that is capable of carrying all these properties, of having all these properties, maybe of existing on its own, and that's what I call the substance. But John Locke's not allowed to do that, being an empiricist. So he has a problem, and he skips over it, because he uses the word substance in his book, and every time you think, well, now you should make the next move and say, hmm, that's odd. I am an empiricist. I say that I can only have knowledge about things that I can observe. I can't observe a substance, so I should claim I do not have knowledge about that. So it's either claiming I don't know, I can't have knowledge about it, or you have to say, well, uh, clearly I'm not an empiricist anymore. You could go either of these, you could do either of these things, but Locke doesn't do either of these things. So there is a problem of substance for an empiricist if you say, I have knowledge of substances, I have this idea of substance. You can't trace it back to any experience, to any observation or reflection, to any perception or reflection. You can't do that. So that's a problem for John Locke's epistemology, his empiricist epistemology. Okay, so let's go to another element of his epistemology, knowing that this is uh, already a problem. So if you look at a cup, for instance, you observe all these properties, and then the question is, okay, uh, can we classify these properties? Can we say something more about that? And then it's important
that John Locke says well. These properties that we observe leave all kinds of ideas in us and that there are different types of properties. There are primary pro properties or qualities as we call them. Those are the properties that exist on their own. That means independent of an observer. And there are secondary qualities that are properties that exist because there is a perceiver that is someone that observes the cup. The cup is white, red, and black. So these colors, for instance, those are secondary qualities. They exist because we observe them. They don't observe, and they don't uh, exist uh, independently of us. A good example is hot and cold water. If you have a bucket of water, and that is say 18 degrees Celsius, so it has a certain temperature and you can measure that. So that's the primary quality. Every one of us, if we measure the temperature of this bucket of water or this water in the bucket, then we find out if you use uh, the proper method that it's 18 degrees Celsius. Now, is that warm or is that cold? Well, that depends on you. On a winter's day, if you've been throwing snowballs with your bare hands and then you put your hands into the bucket of water that is that has the primary quality of having the temperature of 18 degrees Celsius, you might say, oh, this is, this is nice, this is warm. Well, compared to the way you feel uh, in winter. But in summer, you might say 18 degrees Celsius is kind of cold, so it's kind of refreshing to put your hands into the bucket in summer. So is 18 degrees then cold and warm? No, it's 18 degrees Celsius and it's cold depending on the observer and it's warm depending on the observer. Basically we ascribe the property of being cold and being warm to the water, but the water actually isn't warm or it isn't cold, it's 18 degrees Celsius, and depending on the observer, it's either experienced as warm or cold. But we then usually say it's warm or cold. We also say, well, it's warm outside in summer, but it's not warm outside. We experience this temperature of 30 degrees Celsius as warm. And that's the difference. Primary properties do exist on their own. If all human beings died, then this water would still be 18 degrees Celsius, but no one would be there to say that it's cold or warm. So the secondary property wouldn't be there anymore. It depends, the secondary property, the secondary quality depends on the observer. So if you take a look at a snowball, then the roundness of the snowball is responsible for the idea of roundness in us and roundness is a primary quality if there are no human beings the snowball is still round but it's not white anymore if no one is around so the idea of white is not coming from a primary quality the snowball itself isn't white and that's counterintuitive i know when we saw in in the uh, philosophy of mind course already that we are naive realists about secondary qualities that is usually we think that the cup is white of itself but it isn't so it doesn't exist anymore if we don't exist but the snowball might still exist well if the snowball doesn't exist anymore uh, then the roundness of course of the snowball is gone uh, because that's a property of a uh, thing itself, and if we are gone and the snowball still exists, it's still round. Now, we've discussed this already uh, in the uh, Philosophy of Mind course, so this should not be new, but the interesting thing is that, and students usually uh, ask this question as well, so if the wideness of the cup is a secondary property what about its height what is about its shape because it's also something we experience isn't that also a secondary property is Locke 
and with him Galileo and Descartes and Boyle because they also accepted the distinction between primary and secondary properties. Is Locke not wrong? Are not all the properties that Locke classifies as primary properties, aren't those properties also secondary properties? Aren't those primary qualities also not secondary qualities? And that takes us to George Berkeley because he argues, yes, all allegedly primary qualities are in fact secondary qualities. Let's look at his epistemology, his idealism. Berkeley argues that all the properties of the physical world, we ascribe to the physical world, are secondary properties, are secondary qualities. So they all depend on an observer. To be is to be perceived. I hope that you'll see that he basically says that all properties are secondary qualities because to be white, like the cup or a snowball, or to be yellow as a banana, or to be warm as a bucket of water of 18 degrees Celsius in winter, that all depends on a perceiver. So for the water to be warm it has to be perceived this 18 degrees celsius has to be perceived as warm so for warmness to exist <laughs> there has to be someone to uh, observe this primary property of the water and experience it in that way and basically what berkeley says also said it also applies to what other philosophers and other scientists classify as primary qualities. So he says, take for instance height. Height is, according to Locke, Boyle, Galileo, Descartes, height is a primary quality. And Berkeley then says, well, take a pebble. A pebble is really huge, is really high for an ant. But for me, George Berkeley, for me, a human being, it's small. It's not that high. But a cathedral might be high, a tall building. So it depends. It depends on the observer. If something is small or high or tall or big, that depends on the observer. So height, size, are not primary qualities, they are secondary qualities as well. To be tall, to be high, to be big, is to be perceived as high, tall or big. Well, that is what a secondary quality is. So what others classify as primary properties is classified by Berkeley as primary properties. Well, that's still empiricism because it's, you, you know all these things uh, via your experience. So knowledge still comes from experience. So it is empiricism, but it's a strange view, right? You say basically the world depends for its existence on an observer, on you observing the world. I think that is strange. But it's not a denial. I hope you'll see that. It's not a denial of physical reality. Physical reality exists because it's being observed. So it does exist. But it doesn't exist on its own. In Cartesian terms, it's not a substance. There is no physical substance. Now, what would happen to my cup of coffee if I don't look or taste it? If I look away, is it gone? No, it's not. Here it is again, or still. That means that even though I didn't look and there's no one else here, I don't see anyone, it was being observed all the time. Because if to be is to be perceived, to exist is to be perceived, and the cup exists, and it keeps existing even if I am not perceiving it, then there has to be a perceiver that basically perceives everything that 
human beings or ants or butterflies do not observe, perceive. There must be an all-observing observer or something like that. So basically, that's God, the Christian God, because uh, Berkeley, of course, was a Christian. He was a bishop. And that, for him, is the proof of the existence of God. Because my cup of coffee doesn't disappear when I don't look at it. God has to exist. That's basically his argument. And I hope you see that this all hinges on the proper argument that has to show that primary properties actually are secondary properties. If that argument doesn't go, if that argument is flawed and primary properties are just primary properties that exist without an observer, without them the, the being necessarily being observed by an observer, then you don't have to explain why the cup of coffee doesn't uh, disappear when I not observe and say, well, then it has to be observed by God. So it all hinges on that argument. And this view of Berkeley is called idealism. It all says, well, it, it's all basically based on ideas, on mental states. So the physical world depends on uh, uh, the mental world. This idea, well, it is indeed well, you, you can't, at least not in the way uh, Berkeley does it, maybe there is another way, but not in this way. Because the problem is that Berkeley did not reason properly, so idealism can't be defended in this way. The problem is, he makes a primary property into a secondary property, but that doesn't make the primary property go away. If you say, the cup is, say, say that this is 10 centimeters, and it's a small object for a human being, but a large object for an ant, then small and large indeed could be classified as secondary properties. Because that depends on an observer, you could do that. But that it's 10 centimeters high, that's the primary property. Just like 18 degrees Celsius is the primary property of the water in our example, and that's being perceived as warm or hot, depending on the observer, depending on the perceiver. So there is something that is being perceived as warm or uh, cold, and there is something that's being perceived as being tall or small. But that something that's being perceived is the primary property. And of course, you can always say it's tall and it's small or it's large or it's big or it's tiny, but um, that doesn't take away that it has objective dimensions. And those are the primary properties. Those are the primary qualities. So <clears throat> usually if we're talking about British empiricists, you say, okay, it's Locke, Berkeley and Hume. They're all always mentioned together. But usually people think that uh, Berkeley is really counterintuitive, while Hume and Locke say things that are very similar and are very common sense. We all already saw in, in, in the lecture about Aristotle that empiricism is a very common sense epistemology. If you want to know what the world is like, what the facts of the world is, you use your senses, you have to observe. And since Bacon, we are allowed to do experiments again. That's pretty common sense, I think. But we already have seen that Locke has some problems with his epistemology. And uh, now Berkeley is usually discussed because he was very influential in his times. But these days, of course, there are not many idealists anymore because of, well, the problems we just mentioned. You have to have an argument to basically convince others that the world essentially is mental, that the physical world depends on the mental world. And we these days clearly have the idea that it's the other way around. 
when we call that supervenience, mind-body supervenience, and not body-mind supervenience. So the mind supervenes on the body, on the physical world, and not the other way around. That's at least our contemporary view. The last of the three British empiricists is David Hume. He is a very honest empiricist, and we'll see that that amounts to the conclusion that empiricism doesn't work. If you look at Hume, his empiricism is very similar to that of Locke. Uh, he's just a little bit more critical than Locke uh, was of his. So we saw that Locke had his idea of a substance, which he couldn't actually have as an empiricist. Hume recognizes that. And he also recognizes that there is another problem with empiricism, and that's more fundamental. That's, that's basically uh, a problem that amounts to the total re rejection of empiricism and amounts to skepticism. So where Locke just has one small problem, if you uh, look at his classification of ideas and doesn't notice that or doesn't talk about it, Hume basically says, I want to be an empiricist, but in the end has to accept that. He has to be a skeptic. And the problem lies in thinking about the world in general, in thinking about fact, state of affairs, or as Hume calls them, matters of fact. So Hume says, just like Locke, we perceive the world, we acquire knowledge. Here you see that Hume also has an empiricist principle. He calls this, the, this is called the copy principle. We have impressions. There's input coming into our senses and they make impressions in our minds. Looks very much like a signal ring with a logo in, in uh, three dimensions and you push it into a wax uh, tablet or something like that. Uh, and it leaves an imprint in that wax. The input in us, the impressions in us, also leave a kind of imprint behind if the impression is gone. So I'm looking at something, I'm looking at a PowerPoint slide on my laptop. Now I close my eyes and I have the idea of this PowerPoint slide. And that's more faint than the actual impression. If I look at it again, then it's vivid and it has uh, clear letters on it. And if I think back to it, it's well less vivid. The color is less vivid, but still, the idea is a copy from the impression, from what I saw. That's basically empiricism. How do I get knowledge? How do I get these ideas? Via my senses. And normally an idea corresponds nicely to an impression. So I have an idea about the PowerPoint slide and it corresponds to the PowerPoint slide. I have an idea of the coffee cup. And well, how do I get that idea? Well, I look at it, I get this impression and I close my eyes the impression is gone but the idea is there and tomorrow I can think back to a cup of coffee or something like that or in a year from now so I can learn things I can acquire knowledge I can see something I've never seen before I get this impression the thing is gone and I'm left with knowledge about the thing but well, that's basically what an empiricist should say so Hume has an empiricist principle, so he formulates that clearly any, just like Locke, is rightfully classified as an empiricist. He does so himself. But he then thinks that it doesn't work. And we're still thinking about acquiring knowledge about the world. We're still thinking about how to justify our beliefs. Can we indeed know for certain that a certain belief is true, that it corresponds to the fact that it indeed is correct, is a correct representation of the world. Right, so let's take a look at our ideas and how they and how we acquire them and why they might be problematic. Basically, Hume has a, a similar uh, classification of his knowledge of his ideas. 
Uh, so we have simple ideas, complex ideas. You have an impression of something. You, have, you look at the, uh, the snowball. You have an experience of white. You throw away the snowball and you still have knowledge about the color. You have knowledge about white. So no problem there. There's the complex idea. So for instance, you're standing on uh, Arthur's seat. Arthur's seat is a mountain uh, in, near Edinburgh. Uh, Hume was a Scottish philosopher from Edinburgh, uh, so he's standing on uh, Arthur's seat and he's looking over Edinburgh and he has this complex impression. There's this movement and colours and sounds and shapes, so all a very complex impression and that results in a complex idea, the complex idea of the city of Edinburgh. And then you close your eyes and you can think back to that city. You can go down the mountain. Uh, you can go back to his house on St. David Street and think about Edinburgh. He has this idea. He has knowledge. So no problem there. But there seems to be a problem with another idea of a city, that of New Jerusalem, because New Jerusalem doesn't exist. And um, it's... A hypothetical city where I believe the, the the roofs are made of gold and they're all diamonds and rubies in the walls and the street something like that and how can you have an idea about that well you can you have seen gold you have seen city you have seen roof you have seen houses uh, you have seen roads you have seen diamonds you have seen rubies so this complex ideas indeed is a set of other ideas, many of them are simple ideas. So the solution is you can reduce this complex idea to simple ideas that correspond to previous experiences, to previous impressions. So there is no problem at all. Okay, so that's not a problem. So what is a problem? This is difficult. So I have made a knowledge clip about this that is an alternative to the work groups we normally would have uh, were it not for corona crisis. So Hume is clearly an empiricist. He has this copy principle. He says we can only gain knowledge, we can only gain ideas from impressions, from experience. Now, when we think about the world, when we reason about the world, when we uh, are, are thinking about the world as uh, having knowledge about it, then we, we think about the matters of fact. Just reality, the world is just all facts together, the matters of fact. And then we always use the concept of causality. That's not that strange, I think. I think that's a, a right uh, observation. There are all kinds of uh, all uh, e kinds of events happening in the world, and every event is the effect of previous event, and it might cause new events. So I'm saying something to you, that is, I'm recording something. That's an event, and I will upload it to YouTube. That's an event, and then if you click the watch button, you uh, you can watch it, and it causes you to see this video, to hear it, and that causes you to have all kinds of ideas. So the world is a complex chain of causal events or events that are causally related to each other. So if we want to have knowledge about the world, we should be able to classify this event as the cause of that event or this event as the effect of a previous event. So the spark caused the explosion. How can you know that a spark caused the explosion or the lack of dopamine induced Parkinson's disease or the crisis caused unemployment? How can you know these things? Well, you can only have knowledge about them if you can have knowledge that indeed one event is the cause of the other event. So you should be able to have knowledge about causes. If you can't ever establish that A is the cause of B, then you can have knowledge about anything in the world. 
And that amounts to skepticism, if that would be the conclusion. If we now would say, well, David Hume has thought about this, and his conclusion is, hmm, I can't have knowledge about any causal relation in the world, then he has to become a skeptic. And, of course, that's the problem with his um, empiricist epistemology. That is the conclusion he had to infer in the end. So let's see how this works. Why? Hume started as an empiricist, but ended up as a skeptic. So he says, if we think about the world, we think about the fact, the matters of fact, the events happening in the world as causes and effects. I can give all kinds of examples. I think he's right. So if we can't have knowledge about causality, then we can't have knowledge about anything in the world. And that's basically the claim of the skeptic. Now, let's look at causality. Hume says, when do we classify event A as the cause of event B? And the example he uses is that of two billiard balls colliding. The first one collides with the second. That's event A. And event B is the rolling away of the second billiard ball. That is something we classify as cause and effect. When do we classify this and other events, A and B, as cause and effect? Well, that has to be three elements that have to be satisfied, three requirements that have to be satisfied, three things that have to be the case. So when do we say that event A is the cause of B? Well, event A has to come prior to B. So there is this element of priority. A has to occur to occur before B. So if the collision of the two billiard balls occurs before the rolling away of the second billiard ball, then this requirement is met. If there's first the rolling away of the second billiard ball and then one collides with that, then this movement the rolling of the second billiard ball, is not caused by the later collision of a billiard ball against it. Then we don't say that's cause and effect. That would be, that might be a new cause for a new effect, again rolling away of the second billiard ball, but that's not the right order. The right order is event A can only be classified as the cause of event B if it occurs prior to B. And that is something you can perceive. So an empiricist can have knowledge of the event A, the collision of the billiard balls, occurring prior to event B, the rolling away of the second billiard ball. Okay, so no problem there. Then there is contiguity. So that's with a G, that's not a typo. That is contiguity of event A and B. And that means that event A and B have to be located near each other in time and space. So if we have a billiard ball colliding with the second one, the first one with the second billiard ball, and the second one rolls away, well, that is indeed near each other in space, event A and event B, and also in time. Immediately after the collision, the second billiard ball rolls away. So if we, if we have um, a collision of two billiard balls in Amsterdam, and in New York, there is a billiard ball rolling away. We don't say that the collision of the two billiard balls in Amsterdam is the cause of another billiard ball rolling away in New York because, well, this requirement of contiguity is not as satisfied. They, they are not located near enough. And the same goes for um, the location in time. So, of course, the first requirement, priority should be met, and then you take a look at, well, how quickly does the effect occur after the occurrence of the collision? So there's the collision, and then immediately after that, the second billiard ball rolls away. Then you say, okay, this requirement is met. If you have the collision, and then two years later, the second billiard ball rolls away, then we say, no, that's, that's not cause and effect. There's something strange going on, what it is, I don't know, but the rolling away of the second billiard ball is not caused by the, the collision of the first one against it. So, 
Again, this is something you can perceive, you can observe in a bar where you go and play some pool or uh, billiards. You, you can see that when two billiard balls collide, then that second billiard ball rolls away there and then. So no problem uh, for an empiricist to have knowledge about contiguity of event A and B. The problem is in the necessity of the event B, the, the event B occurring after event A. So event B necessarily follows event A. It could not have been otherwise. It could not have been a coincidence. So take another example. Take uh, a, a tall building uh, and a fly landing on top of the building. So that's event A, the landing of the fly on top of a tall building. Event B is uh, the uh, tall building uh, crumbling down. It's destroyed. Well, the destruction of the tall building is not caused by the fly, even though the fly lands on the tall building prior to it uh, it's being demolished. It also is uh, near each other. The two events are near each other in time and, and, and space, but it's a coincidence. It's probably being demolished by uh, some people blowing it up or something like that. Uh, so it is a coincidence, two events occurring that are not causally related. So the events should be necessarily related. And that, of course, is a problem, because have you ever seen a necessary relation or tasted it or observed it in any way? And, and that, of course, is a problem. So if causality is the way we think about the world, is the way we think about the facts, and it has these three elements, then the third one cannot be observed by, uh, by us. And then being an empiricist, claiming that you can only have knowledge about things you can observe, you can have knowledge about the necessary relationship between event A and B, even though they might be necessarily related, of course, but you cannot have knowledge about it. And that means that you cannot have knowledge about causal relations in the world. You cannot know anything about the matters of fact, because you always need to know the causal relations, and you can't have knowledge about causal relations, because you can't have knowledge about the necessary relationship of event A and B that is part of the concept of causality. That means you can't have knowledge about the facts, that means you can't have knowledge about the world, which amounts to skepticism. So Hume wants to be an empiricist, he says we think about the world in terms of cause and effect and we can have knowledge about that. So, hmm, bummer, I need to be a skeptic. Wait a minute, maybe there's a way out. Maybe I can have knowledge after all. So he comes up with an attempt to save knowledge and this makes psychology relevant for his epistemology, just like it was, or well, on, on a par with how that was the case in Bacon, we saw in Bacon that we see regularity where there might not be regularity, but that is what we do. That is the way our mind works, and we should be aware that that is inductive reasoning, and that that is not a valid way of reasoning, and that, that your conclusion might be wrong if you use induction. The regularity you think you see might not be there. For a similar reason, Hume is also relevant for psychology and psychology for epistemology. So Hume says, okay, I'm an empiricist. I want to have knowledge about the world. Therefore, I need to have knowledge about causal relations. Therefore, I need to have knowledge about necessary relations. I cannot have knowledge about necessary relations because I can't see them. Therefore, I cannot have knowledge about causal relations. Therefore, I can have knowledge at all. And therefore, I have to be a skeptic instead of an empiricist. But maybe I can try to save knowledge in a different way. 
So necessity, I can't perceive that. And then he goes and also refers to our psychology. He says, just like Bacon, yeah, well, we see regularity. So we do use the concept of causality if we reason about the world. I think he's right about that. So that's something he observed, he noticed. He says, whenever we perceive a constant conjunction, we conclude automatically. It's not that we say, well, what's the conclusion here? And we automatically do that. So it's like seeing regularity where there might not be regularity or there might be regularity. But what you see, what, what we do is, if we see a constant conjunction of two events, so constant all the time, conjunction, two events going together. So if we perceive a constant conjunction, then we conclude that these two events that are constantly going together, that are all the time going together, the collision of two billiard balls always goes together with the second event rolling away of the second billiard ball. That's a constant conjunction. We then conclude that this is a causal relationship, that A causes B. And of course, the constant conjunction can be perceived. You can go to a bar, you can see two people uh, playing pool, and you see, well, every time two billiard balls collide, the second one rolls away. You don't have to see them all, but without exception, this is what happens if you go to a bar, or this, this is what you have observed when you go to a bar and see two people playing pool. Two billiard balls collide, second one rolls away. All the time. So it's constant, and those two events go together at the conjunction. So if we perceive this constant conjunction, we conclude that there is a causal relationship. And of course, the constant conjunction is something you can perceive. You can say, okay, I've been watching this uh, uh, game of billiards uh, uh, the, um, the entire night. People have been playing here, and it was the case every time. There was constant conjunction of event A with event B, event A being the collision of two billiard balls, event B being the rolling away of the second billiard ball. So do we now know that event A caused B, that the collision causes the rolling away of the second billiard ball? And Hume says himself, he sees that this doesn't work because it's a form of inductive reasoning. If you say, ah, this is the cause of that, this event A is the cause of B, then you say, well, it's a necessary relationship. It will always be the case. It's a law. It's a ca causality requires necessity. And that means that this regularity is not something that happened by accident. It's not a coincidence. It's something that had to occur and therefore it will also occur in the future. So then you basically have used induction to infer that this is a causal relation because if it's a causal relation it's necessarily it's necessarily a uh, regular relation. It's something that will occur every time and that means that you have inferred to a general law. So causal reasoning is always inductive reasoning. And induction is an invalid way of reasoning. So if you know that, you also know that you don't really have knowledge. Induction cannot be used to justify your belief. You cannot use induction to justify your belief that event A caused event B. And therefore, you have to say, well, I do not know that event A caused event B because I have no justification. I think it's true. I have to believe that the collision caused the second Billy Walter L, but it's mere opinion. I think it's true, but I have no justification. I cannot explain to you that you have to accept this. I cannot explain that indeed it's necessarily the case. I might be wrong because I used induction to infer the causal relation. And then 
that means that Hume's uh, epistemology being empiricist, being an empiricist epistemology, fails. He has to become a skeptic. Of course, in everyday practice, this usually doesn't lead to many problems. If you go to a bar and you want to play some pool and you say, uh, give me some uh, pool balls that if they collide, then the second one rolls away, they will say, well, no more drinks for you. Because that's really strange, because we have this idea that if two billion balls, two pool balls collide, they indeed... Uh, that, that event will indeed cause uh, the rolling away of the second billiard ball. But in theory, it's a problem. If you want to have knowledge, if you want to say, I have justified and true beliefs about the world, then you can never be sure about anything because you can never be, you can never know that there will not be an event A in the future that will not cause B. And as long as you don't know that, you can't have knowledge. All candles melt in the sun. I believe it's true. I have a candle made out of wax. Sun produces heat. The candle will melt. That's regular. That will happen again. That is a causal relation, I believe. Do I know this? No, because it's basically an inductive inf uh, inference based on having seen two or three or ten or a billion candles melting in the sun, but you can't have observed all of them, so you can't really know that. So, since inductive reasoning is an invalid form of reasoning, the knowledge re resulting from it is not real knowledge, because you don't have a justification. Induction can be used as a justification, as a justification for your beliefs. So Hume, in the end, has to conclude that causation is not a concept that empiricists can have knowledge about. And if causation is needed to have knowledge about facts about the world, then you can't have knowledge about the facts of the world. And since the world consists of facts, you can't have knowledge about the world. Well, that's skepticism. That's skepticism. So Hume had a lot of beliefs of which he thought they were true. He did believe that he lived in Edinburgh. And he was... He, he did believe that his... Uh, recipe for... Uh, what was it? Sheep had uh, soup was uh, really good. But did he have knowledge about the world? No, he didn't. Not according to himself. He didn't know that all candles melt in the, in the sun. He didn't even know of one candle that the sun would be able to cause to melt it, even if he had seen it melt, for instance. That might be just a correlation. It might be just a coincidence, just like a fly uh, landing on uh, the flat and then uh, the flat collapsing. That might be just a correlation. You never know, being an empiricist. The problem now is, I hope you see that you can't but use induction in reasoning about the world. In science, you use induction very uh, explicitly or implicitly if you think about the, the world in terms of cause and, uh, cause and effect, and you, you do that. Induction is not a valid way of reasoning, and therefore, you could in some, say, in some sense say that, um, well, it's irrational to use induction in science. In one of our next lectures, we'll look at Karl Popper, who defends the idea that science is a rational human endeavor, a human discipline, and therefore, it should indeed not use induction. So we'll come back to that later. Maybe we could get rid of induction. But for now, it seems that if you have a general law, if you think about causes, then, and, and if you think about causes, you basically think about general laws. So if you think about laws, then you use induction, and induction is invalid 
and that means that you can't use it as a justification for your beliefs and that means that your beliefs are just that mere beliefs they're doxa in the terms of uh, Plato they're not epistema they're not justified and true belief that might be true it might be true that the billiard ball caused the rolling uh, the, the collision of the first billiard ball with the second caused the second to roll away but you don't know it so okay this is a problem and we have to return to that in a later lecture So let's briefly summarize what we've seen today and evaluate modern rationalism and empiricism. Rationalism clearly is untenable because it accepts inborn ideas that clearly do not exist. I think John Locke uh, gives us a very convincing argument there. Also, if you look at Descartes' epistemology, you need to accept the existence of God and that God is good. Otherwise, you'll end up with just the cogito, just I think, therefore I am. And if you then not get rid, if you cannot get rid of the evil demon, then you might be uh, tricked into believing that 2 and 2 equals 4 and that there is a physical world while there actually uh, two and two isn't four, and there is no physical world, and then you cannot have get, then you cannot have knowledge about anything at all, except for your own existence, and that amounts to skepticism with knowledge about the rest of the world. So, uh, even though it is less extreme than Plato's view, it's clearly a problematic view on uh, knowledge acquisition. It's clearly a problematic epistemology. Empiricism, well we looked at Locke, he has a notion in his uh, epistemology that he couldn't have, he has this idea of substance that he couldn't have as an empiricist. Well you might say well he could work that out, he could give up uh, empiricism or he could give up on the notion of a substance. Okay so that might be fixed, it might be, he might be able to fix that. Uh, Berkeley, okay, so idealism, really strange theory, nobody believes that anymore, where well, almost nobody believes it anymore. Um, uh, we saw that he clearly didn't reason properly. His argument for classifying the primary qualities and secondary qualities didn't work, so he didn't show that to be is to be perceived where it goes, uh, where it pertains to um, uh, the primary qualities, so we can reject that problem and that would also of course be a problem for uh, for Locke is the notion of causality Hume shows that we cannot have knowledge about causal relationships and because all knowledge about the world is knowledge of causal relationships we cannot have knowledge about anything at all so you can't have knowledge about individual things individual e events but also not about the laws of nature and of course that is a big problem because we have these Newtonian laws Newton did find out about all kinds of laws and if you use them to predict events in the world they worked really well so there was quite kind of optimism about acquiring knowledge about the physical world using the scientific method because of, well, the discoveries of Newton. He discovered those laws and they worked really well. But if Hume's right, we can't know anything about these laws. We, can't know, we cannot know these laws because these laws all are about causal relations in the world. That's why this Cartesian Newtonian worldview is called a mechanistic worldview. The, the universe, everything in the universe is kind of a big clock. The universe is kind of a big clock. It's a big machine, a mechanism of things that relate to each other as cause and effect. 
which is described by the Newtonian laws, but the Newtonian laws are very successful in making predictions, which we can't say we know it because of the fact that we can't have knowledge about causal relations, according to Hume. But Hume was an empiricist. Next time, we'll take a look at someone who says, well, rationalism and empiricism both have their problems. Maybe we could solve these problems and justify knowledge by combining rationalism and empiricism. Immanuel Kant was someone, a philosopher, that started off as an astronomer, really impressed by the Newtonian laws, the discovery of Newtonian laws, and he wanted to save them. And he saw rationalists can do that, empiricists can do that, but maybe we can have a combination of rationalism, a synthesis of rationalism and empiricism. And that might show that we actually can have knowledge about the causal laws in our world. So we'll take a look at that in next lecture. Let's look at an old exam question. It's a question about René Descartes. René Descartes was looking for true knowledge and therefore performed his, exper his experiment of radical doubt. What was the foundation of his thinking? Does this foundation making him, make him an empiricist or a rationalist? Well, before looking at uh, an, uh, any answer, just remember, just write it down on a piece of scrap paper whether Descartes was a rationalist or an empiricist. And he was a rationalist. I hope you know that. And if you write that down on a piece of uh, scrap paper, you won't doubt it yourself. So, uh, Answer A, you cannot go wrong in your own experience. Well, that would be an empiricist view. For example, you experience that there is a pink elephant coming out of the wall. Well, probably there is not really a pink elephant coming out of the wall, but you can have that experience if you take some drugs or something like that. Where you might be mistaken in uh, is the conclusion that uh, you base on that experience, that there really is a pink elephant, you might be wrong there. Uh, but not, of course, in your experience. This makes it an empiricist. Well, that would that's something an empiricist would say, but Descartes was a rationalist. So answer A is incorrect. B, you cannot be mistaken about the fact that you exist. Well, that is what Descartes says. I think, therefore I am, cogito ergo sum. I cannot doubt my own existence. If I do that, then I necessarily need to exist. So I really can't really doubt my uh, existence. That makes him a rationalist. Well, that's something that he sees clearly and distinctly with his ratio, with his reason. So answer B is correct. So let's like take a look at C and D then. You cannot be mistaken about the fact that 2 plus 2 equals 4. Well, Descartes says, well, I have been wrong about really difficult mathematical problems. So what's to say that I'm not wrong with uh, the solution to really easy, seemingly easy mathematical problems? It seems easy to tune two equals four, but maybe it's not as easy as I think. Maybe I'm being deceived by an evil demon. So C is incorrect. Uh, D, you can be mistaken about the experience that you exist. Well, that would be a, a need, an empiricist argument. It's based on the experience that you exist, that you exist, and not the rational insight that you have to exist if you would try to doubt your own existence. So answer B is the only correct answer. That's it for lecture two. Stay safe.